OK, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fecundity and infection with parasitic worms. So uh, when we think about these parasitic helminth worms, there are lots of things that we might think about. We might think about um, sort of the health effects of these, and parasitic worms can be affected. It can be associated with things like anemia, uh, growth deficits, cognitive deficits, um, and also increased susceptibility to some things like viral infection. Um, but they also seem to be associated with some relatively beneficial things. People that are infected with helminths have fewer allergies, uh, increased gut microbiota. And uh, this is another benefit, actually, perhaps, or cost of walking around barefoot. Um, and that, that you might get infected. And so you might hear about people traveling to intentionally infect themselves by walking around barefoot in latrines to cure their allergies or cure other sorts of things. Um, and so the, the helmets I'm going to talk about today are actually two species, despite the title. Uh, I'm going to talk about hookworm and roundworm. And um, for our purposes, we'll talk a little bit more about what the differences are here later on. Um, so uh, part of the reason helmets seem to have these various sorts of effects is that they have effects on host uh, immune function. And uh, in general, what they seem to do is they, they shift immunity towards this more Th2 type phenotype. So T cells, we've got different types of T cells. And this Th2 phenotype is sort of anti-inflammatory. Um, and helmets are also affecting Tregs as well, which is also anti-inflammatory, regulating in inflammation. Um, and so why is this interesting here? Well, one thing that might be interesting is that there's another parasite that also causes immunity to shift towards the Th2 type phenotype, and that's the human fetus. Um, and so pregnancy is characterized by Th2 biasing as well, uh, as well as some reductions in autoimmune disorders and things that are similar to some of the effects you see with helminth infections. Um, so um, one thought about this is that this Th2 biasing is related to uh, preventing the mother from rejecting the, the fetus, which is immunologically distinct from, from the mother. And there's some evidence that, that this is necessary to prevent rejection of the pregnancy. Uh, so this suggests an interesting question. Could parasites have a positive effect on fertility by shifting immune function towards this more Th2 biased phenotype? And you see this shifting happening towards the end of the menstrual cycle as well, perhaps in preparation for implantation, that sort of thing. And I have a picture of Melanie up there. She's, I'm sure she's sick of me telling this story, but this was in part inspired by she went to the field with her husband and got pregnant very quickly. And so we thought, maybe this had something to do with it. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a related but question that I'm not going to talk about, but it's interesting to think about. And that is, did helminths evolve to mimic this most effective of parasites, the, the fetus? But we can talk about that later. Um, so there's another reason to think about how helminths might affect fertility, and that's we're thinking about life history theory, and thinking about how resources and energy might be allocated between competing demands, that being maintenance, growth, reproduction. And we can think about when individuals become infected, what's going to happen to the energy they're putting into reproduction. And this is going to relate to the type of type of parasite or pathogen that they're infected with. Um, so we can think about three types of parasites, there, or pathogens. I'm just going to use the two interchangeably here. Um, and uh, so there might be some sort of infection that you get, and it goes up very quickly, and then you recover. Uh, and in this sort of a circumstance, well, it makes sense you'd want to just limit reproduction, put your energy into immune function, limit reproduction, until you get over that, and then reproduce after that. Um, we might have a parasite, though, or some kind of pathogen where you get infected and there's gradually increasing costs of that over time, say through, through your lifespan. Um, and if you're infected with something like this, well, what you might want to do instead is shift, shift your reproduction forward. And we call this fecundity compensation. Uh, it could be an increase in reproductive rate or a shifting towards earlier ages of reproduction associated with these increasing costs. And you can think about these costs as direct costs, but also indirect costs uh, related to things like increases in mortality risk later on. Uh, we might also have a parasite that you just get infected. You're always infected. You always have costs. And there's not much you can do about that. You can't shift around a lot. So you might just see reductions throughout. Um, and so in uh, large-bodied mammals, 
there is at least one example of, of life history changes associated with infection with a parasite. In this case, it's a, it's a rare transmissible cancer. So Tasmanian devils have very low genetic diversity, and so there's this tumor. They bite each other on the mouth, uh, and this tumor can be transmitted from individual to individual. And in this population, this results in uh, big increases in mortality. Um, and as a population as a whole, there's also been documented an associated shift of reproduction towards earlier ages in Tasmanian devils. Uh, but in general, there are very few studies of how parasites affect reproduction or reproductive rates in large-bodied mammals, or, and in, in particular in humans. Um, apart from some things looking at sexually transmitted diseases and that can cause sterility and things like that. Okay, so uh, we might have different predictions about the effects of helminths on human reproduction, depending on exactly what sort of, what sort of parasite they are. So helminths can't reproduce these helminths in any way inside the host. Uh, you get infected, um, and so they have a life cycle stage that's outside of the host. So you wouldn't necessarily think you'd get increase in cost with time. Um, but it's possible. They are very long-lived, um, can live for one to 10 years, something like that. Um, so depending on what they look like, we might see different kinds of patterns. So if there are constant costs, either type one or type two, we'd see reproduction going down, um, either whenever individuals are infected across the lifespan if they're continuously infected. Uh, the immune biasing, if infections are shifting immunity and the parasites aren't really having that much in terms of costs, we might actually see increases in reproduction or in uh, ability to conceive across the lifespan. Uh, or if we have sort of increasing costs, we might see fecundity compensation. That is a shift in reproduction towards earlier ages. Um, so this is a study done with the Chimane, you've heard about probably a few times in the last uh, day or two. Uh, and these are individuals that are forager horticulturalists in the Bolivian Amazon. Um, largely a natural fertility population, uh, so the total fertility rates about nine, nine children per woman. Um, helmets are very common, about 70% uh, of individuals are infected at any given time. Um, so we can look at in this population, the way I'm going to operationalize this is to look at whether helmet infections affect the likelihood of conception following a pregnancy. That is, do they, do they lengthen or shorten interbirth intervals? And do we see this effect across all ages? Because we want to look and see if there's a shifting effect across age as well. Um, do they affect age of first reproduction? And then we might as well look at what are the consequences of this overall. Um, so the sample is actually a little bit complicated. Um, the actual end, there's, so there's two groups of women I'm going to look at here. Nola Paris group that is not yet reproduced. Uh, it's 192 women. We've got 288 observations on them. Um, and then there's a multi-paris group, 427 women, 829 observations. Um, and so this is following them longitudinally, so many people are, are observed multiple times. Um, we took out, so there's very little, it's mostly a natural fertility population, but there were just a couple of women who had used uh, Depo-Provera were taken out. Um, and so I'm looking at uh, recurrent events, Cox proportional hazard models, to look at hazard of becoming pregnant, after, after giving birth, so hazard of becoming pregnant again after that time point. Um, and there's a variety of controls I've put in here. Um, so there might be a variety of uh, other sort of factors that might affect interbirth intervals. So we might imagine physical condition might have an effect. So we can use things like BMI, and hemoglobin levels to look at this. We might affect, expect clustering by village, because villages vary both in sort of their uh, acculturation and uh, market integration, uh, their education levels, as well as potentially their exposure to helmets. Um, and so we've got a variety of measures of, of geography and individual level acculturation, so levels of education, Spanish ability. Um, and we might expect some seasonality as well. Um, so to just uh, cut to the chase on these, because I'm not going to go into them too much, we do see clustering by village. We do see uh, an effect of education where women with more education have longer interbirth intervals. Uh, we do, and Spanish as well, Spanish, which is closely related to education. Uh, we do see some seasonality. Um, uh, 
but none of these things really affect what I'm going to talk about next, which is the effect of the helmets. They don't, they don't change it much when you control for these things. Okay. Uh, so um, this is what the best fit model is, looking at which, uh, which factors should go in here. Um, and rather than go over the model, I'm just going to show you what it looks like. So this is our uh, proportion becoming pregnant at different ages. So we've got age 25, age 35, and age 45. Uh, your likelihood, your interbirth intervals are getting longer as you go along. So these are the uninfected women. These are the women with hookworm. They've got a somewhat lengthened interbirth interval, reduced hazard of infection. These are the women with roundworm. They actually have uh, an uh, increased chance, shortened interbirth intervals, increased chance of becoming infected. And a uh, number of individuals are co-infected. So that looks a little something like this, where at earlier ages, and this is mostly driven by, driven by the age, so the effect of the hookworm is the same at all three ages. The effect of the ascaris, the, the acceleration of uh, reproduction, the shortening of interbirth intervals is primarily early in age, and that effect declines with age. And so we can see that co-infected individuals have shortened interbirth intervals early, early on, and longer interbirth intervals later on in the lifespan. Okay, so we could say helmets do affect, seem to affect the likelihood of conception. These are highly significant effects. Uh, are they associated with changes in age of first reproduction? We see something very, very similar here, where individuals in the nulla pair sample that are infected with um, uh, roundworm, ascaris, show uh, an increased likelihood of becoming pregnant at an earlier age. Uh, the women with hookworm show later age. Same sort of pattern. And if we add these sort of two effects together, we can imagine these have Fairly significant, could have fairly significant effects on the number of offspring that people have. And these are a little bit exaggerated. So all of these Chimane women are going to be uh, infected and not infected at some point in their life. So there aren't very many that are going to fall into always infected throughout their entire lifespan. So this is a projection of what it would look like if they were always infected throughout their lifespan. Uh, and we could see that that could have an effect of a couple of children, basically. Okay, so uh, our predictions, constant cost, we seem to see that with the hookworm infection. Uh, but with the, uh, with the roundworm infection, we see things that are more consistent with maybe immune biasing, where interbirth intervals are shortened, possibly suggesting um, increased chances of conception, and possibly something that looks like fecundity compensation. Although typically with fecundity compensation, we'd see more costs later on. And it's not necessarily clear whether we're seeing those costs, but we are seeing the effects are much stronger earlier on. Um, so why different effects with hookworm and roundworm? Well, a number of, so one possibility is that a number of studies find that hookworm is associated more with sort of a mixed Th1, Th2 response, uh, whereas roundworm seems to be more of a purely polarized Th2 response from the immune function. And this is some data that, that we've done using whole blood stimulation with PHA. Uh, and looking at the cytokines that are produced. Um, and um, I don't have time to go into it too much, but we see something that does look like that in individuals infected with one or the other. Okay, so just a last couple of notes, thinking about fertility, helmets, and the old friends hypothesis. There are really three possibilities we might think about. Maybe human fertility is optimized for conditions with helmets. Uh, if helmets were common throughout all of our history, and maybe lack of helmets might be associated with maladaptive fertility either high or low. Uh, human fertility might have evolved without much influence from helmets. I suppose this is possible. Uh, and then we might expect that either of these sorts of effects of helmets might be sort of produce, if you produce too many children, you can't invest in all of them. So maybe your fertility is too high, or maybe your fertility is too low. Or what might be more likely is intermittent helminth exposure through a lot of human history, selecting for reaction norms, and in which case we might expect these responses to be somewhat optimal uh, given the conditions. And I'm not gonna necessarily weigh in on, on this because I don't have data to speak to this right now, but I think probably the last one is a little bit more likely. Okay, so uh, what kind of significance does this have? Well, it might tell us something that we haven't really thought about a lot about fertility and developing and subsistence populations, particularly as things like resources change. Uh, and as you start to treat and reduce helminth infections, how's that going to affect fertility levels? and likelihood of getting pregnant. Uh, and think about demography throughout, throughout human history and life history schedules. Um, and possibly it might have implications for thinking about 
some modern fertility problems as they might relate to hygiene, hygiene hypothesis or old friends sort of framework. And I'll end with that. <laughs>